Hi folks, welcome to, yes, the first of our little online lectures. These will be required if the class is offered as an online version. Most of the material you will need for the class for your quizzes and papers are in the form of mini essays, charts, and such as that here on Canvas. But you also get my face in the corner of the screen and a little PowerPoint to go with each unit. So this is our first one, our little hello to Emily Dickinson and Walt Whitman. As I am going to assert here that Dickinson and Whitman are, in a manner of speaking, the first real American poets. One exception, and Bradstreet on that, from way back when, way back in the colonial period. Why? Because I am going to tell you that Dickinson and Whitman brought original qualities to poetry, something we will see since, and something that our American writers, even the good ones, didn't necessarily have before. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, gee, we don't spend much time with him these days. He's, he was a wonderful versifier. He wrote epics. Good grief, who wants to read epics? And everybody since, well, before Homer wrote epics. And you look at the American romantics, William Cullen Bryant and all of this with the nature imagery. Um, bad romantic poetry makes me yawn. I like good romantic poetry, but bad romantic poetry makes me yawn. And we had an awful lot of Americans who were very good at that. Um, it's, it was around a bit as they started writing. But again, Bradstreet, unique qualities. Her homespun verse was her work in a, a time when poetry tended to go to high, high blowing uh, metaphors and such as that. Instead, her metaphorically rich poetry is very, very down home. Now, let's step into our period, our time period, and think of Whitman. Whitman and Dickinson, we both think of we think of verse from both of them as very introspective. It was like Browning's dramatic monologues, except, big except, Browning's monologues are the voices of imaginary people. Um, Whitman's seem to be his own. Dickinson, I won't necessarily say her stuff was autobiographical. Rather, they were philosophical ruminations, introspective ones. I won't say that was brand new either. After all, Tennyson was writing in memoriam at about this period. But uh, a lot of original qualities in those regards from both these writers. Now, bigger deal, original form. Gee. Think of poetry and it rhymes. Goodness, Longfellow was good at rhyming things. All sorts of people rhymed things. So we think of the rhyme and blank verse and so forth and figure that that was standard. And gee, there were other things. John Greenleaf Whittier was one of those who wrote a little bit of masterful dialect uh, work, but uh, that wasn't new. Romantic poets, since Robbie Barnes were writing such things as that. Now, get to Whitman, and woo, welcome to free verse, and welcome to a unique form, those long, yes, let's make a long here, if I can get my hand so that you can see them on down on the corner of the screen, long, there we go, right. uh, long lines, Patterns of repetition as he would go back to images, cycle to them, repeat them, repeated scenes, and offer these extended ruminations. He also wrote with curious, very curious word order sometimes. Like to play with word order for effect. And then we think of Dickinson 
and the unique compact stuff of hers. Yeah, we're pulling the hands together here. Still can't do that so you can see it. That's all right. We'll live with it. Um, it yes, yeah, so she, she had close but irregular meter and rhyme. Used a lot of what was would be called near rhyme or slant rhyme, pieces that don't quite rhyme. Short lines, grammar minimized, pulling out those unnecessary adjectives and sometimes some you would expect. Minimized transitions, no stray words, no empty repetition. Abundant images. Description of them often, very sparse, wrote some very imagistically rich poetry, but tended to tighten a lot of those. Coffee is requisite. Um, coffee, I think Dickinson needed to drink more coffee. It would have been good for her mood. Now, uh, <coughs> now, now, back here where we should be, Dickinson, it, use of dashes as transition and punctuation, funky punctuation, capital letters here and there for apparent emphasis. Uh, critics can actually argue about what her she was up to with some of those uh, capital letters. Okay, folks, so no English writer wrote like Whitman. Whitman well, no one wrote like Whitman before Whitman. Whitman has inspired many imitators. Allen Ginsberg's an extreme example. Um, those long lines and things like that, that no English writer wrote like Dickinson either. And Dickinson has inspired a tremendous amount of imitation, but not a tremendous amount of imitation so much as admiration in terms of her goals, in terms of these notions of compactness and precision. Lots of us who write poetry, good or not so good, care about those standards. Imitating her directly is not easy. Dr. West can. He's somewhat masterful, quite masterful with uh, of meter and form and such. Those of us who play more loosely with meter and form just find Dickinson wonderful and think about that kind of goal of precision from her. So that, folks, is very much why we begin with Whitman and Dickinson and why they are so key, so important as for this class, American literature, American poetry takes its real place in the scheme of English language poetry. It becomes a good deal, big deal. And so that concludes our little online lecture. Again, there will, if our class is entirely online, be one of these to go with each unit, but most of the material you need to care about, you have to read. Read it on Canvas, read the assigned material, and also my notes. Thank you.